find myself uh, gravitating around Psalms. So when I want to do my personal devotion and I'm looking for what book to read, I keep on going back to Psalms, 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 Psalms. And I thank God that he speaks to us in different ways. I don't necessarily want to speak about suffering. I want to see how God comes in in our suffering. In my early years in secondary school, I will not call it high school, I went to school at such a time where the culture in my country was such that the freshmen, the sophomores, the, we used to call them, or we used to be called monos. I don't know if that's a familiar term, mono. Mono meaning one. When you are one, that is, the first year of secondary school. And of course, most people, myself included, that's the first time to experience life away from home. Boarding school on default tends to start there. Times were hard. And bullying was so much, so common, so accepted to the extent that if you reported that you are being bullied, The teacher will tell you, wait until you are out of form one, it will stop. Kids cried, some quit school. I remember one of our classmates in form one, uh, first year of secondary school is form one. Because of bullying, he stopped sleeping in the dormitory and he made a nest on top of a tree nearby the dormitory. Because there was this tendency of there are some senior students who had some uh, uh, dislike for some people. They have, it gave them joy to harass you, to bully you. And uh, it, they could make you do all sorts of things, wash their clothes, you know, polish their shoes with your own polish. You know, they make you uh, go get food for them from the cafeteria. Of course, when you bring and you bring you ask if there's meat, they ask you to put your meat on their plate. Very shamelessly. <laughs> tough, tough times. What's in my ear is our headmaster, the head of school, was also new. He joined school the same year we joined. So when we went to report to him, he could tell us, I'm also new, I'm being bullied by the teachers. <laughs> Nowhere to run to. I didn't mind the bullying per se, the work, the washing, the cleaning. And until that one boy fell from the tree and broke his arm, then the story came out that he doesn't even sleep in the dormitory. Parents had to intervene. But worst of it for me was singing. They made us sing for them. <laughs> And they are not church hymns, you know. They are not making us sing church hymns. We are singing 
very vulgar songs, rude songs, songs insulting ourselves, praising them, mockery. I missed home then. Soon after, after uh, I got to form, form four was in my country the last year of high school, I really tried to help protect against bullying. And I could fall out with my colleagues because I was a prefect at school. I take it so personal. I used to still like fighting. If you bully a form one student, I beat you up, trying to make sure that they are not bullied. But that was the life. Later I went to Uganda, and I thank God for Uganda, no bullying, maybe in the school I was, but this is some, some two, three, four years later, Absalom is looking at me as though, are you sure? <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw a different culture altogether, because even the very young, very young students, they call them senior one. They are so comfortable at school, they will talk at the senior students, nobody cares. But my suffering now here was a different culture. I could not even get their English, you know, their accent was totally different. <laughs> Everything was different, their food was different. I didn't eat for a whole week. I didn't go to toilet for a whole week either. I remember one time, you know, when you are alone, because I happen to be just uh, two or three international students, two from Tanzania, one from Kenya, a few others came later, uh, but I was so lonely that I missed speaking my own language. And I'm in the toilet, I'm trying to speak to myself. <laughs> because nobody to speak to. Get into the culture, they have a different other uh, language called Ugandan, I had not learned a word, you know, you're in that phase where you don't even hear anything. I called home and told them, I don't think I'll continue. And my father is not so easy on us. If you tend like you are giving up, he starts preparing you for what you face ahead. <laughs> so I'm calling home, telling them I want to come back home. And my dad is lecturing me, telling me, don't think life is as easy as you think. That's the easy, and let I see truth. This is, that was the easiest version of life that I had down there. I want to talk about suffering. Because there are times when things tend to move too slow for us. There are times when things tend to even look stuck. you just stuck somewhere and no hope of movement. There are also times when things move too fast for you, that you don't even have time to focus on what is important in life. The speed is too high, you can't even concentrate. Striking that balance. <laughs> The pari pari culture. Yeah. It's not in the slow. Uh, from the scripture Muxanin read for us in Peter, Second Peter, uh, it, defines, it defined that there is a slow as people understand it, not as slow in the slow that people understand. There's God's speed. And we are taken back to the time when they were held captive in Babylon. Our scripture in Psalms 137, the historical context of this scripture is a time when one king of Babylon, the infamous king Nebuchadnezzar, they are happy. In God's time. Amen. The kingdom of heaven is for such as those ones. Wow. They, they don't care for stress. You get stress. For them, they have no stress. <laughs> so King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, one of the most powerful kings who ever lived, 
took captive the people of Judah. We know Judah and Israel. Israel as one country for 120 years when Israel was formed. Israel was one united kingdom. After 120 years, that's after 40, 40, 40, either 120 or 122 years, the kingdom split into the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom remained or retained the name Israel. The southern kingdom adopted the name Judah. And that's where Jerusalem was. That's where the temple was. The first king of Israel was King Saul. Between King Saul and King David, there was an interlude of two years led by one of the sons of Saul. After David, of course, Solomon took power. Those three main kings, each one of them ruled for 40 years. Thereafter, so many things happened. The division, first of all, meant that the Israel, the northern kingdom, they stopped worshipping God. They stopped worshipping Yahweh. So worship remained only in Jerusalem. But we are so sudden to learn that even in the southern kingdom, that is Jerusalem, that is Judah, they also lost touch. They stopped observing the holy festivals. They forgot about Sabbath. They forgot about Jubilee. And Jeremiah prophesied of what is going to happen to them. This is the time of King Zedekiah. Zedekiah is king at the time of the capture. When the first temple, the temple built by King Solomon is destroyed. This is 586 BC. It's a historical event. It's a fact. The temple is brought to ruins. And this was a huge thing because this was a national project that took years to accomplish. It's not just a small structure. It could have qualified to be what we call one of uh, the world uh, Guinness, the, the, one of the wonders of the world. Those things that qualify to get into the Guinness World of Records. The temple is destroyed, and the people of Judah are taken captive. It's a hard time for them. It's not as easy as it sounds, because when you are being captured, when you are being taken over, it's war. And I've just alluded to the fact that Israel is now a weakened state, because already the northern kingdom has departed from the southern kingdom. They are no longer like the same people. They've also been, uh, they are having their own problem. They have been taken away. Uh, we, we, you always hear of the lost ten tribes of Israel. They have been captured by other nations, the Syrians. They don't exist anymore. So this is now a community of two tribes, the Benjamites and the people of Judah. They are not as strong, but you know what? They are still God's people. This is what makes this story sad. It's okay for a few people in your nation to be captured, but it's not okay when they capture you and they capture your king as well. King Zedekiah is captured. And before they start on their journey, they remove his eyes. He becomes blind. So he has to traverse from Jerusalem all the way to Babylon, a blind man crying and listening to his people go through so hard time. 
This is like another walk into the wilderness. Those places are deserts, hard places. Their king is also taken captive. And for him, he is taken to prison. He doesn't enjoy even the small freedom that these people are enjoying. Because the Babylonians want them to work for them in Babylon. They want slaves. They want people they can harass. They want people they can bully. And you see the kind of life these people will live. They are living a life of people who have no hope. They are living a life of people who never belonged anywhere. They missed home. The scripture has shown us a picture of how they could just hang around, around the rivers. The great river of Babylon. I believe this is river Tigris. And he has shown a picture of helpless people because they are still God's people. They carried with them their musical instruments. They carried with them the scripture. You know, they had the Torah. They carried the law with them. But in Babylon, these guys are bullies. They want them to sing for them the songs that they used to sing in Zion. And it's so painful for the people from Israel, the people of Judah, that the same songs that we classify as holy, sacred, only to be sung for the Lord, are the same songs that these tormentors, these bullies, want them to sing. They are forced. It's not like, please sing for me, you know. It's, you got to sing. You're a slave. You can be killed any minute. And because it was so hard for them, they hung their harps. Harps are musical instruments. They had harps. They had ten-string lyres. You know, the Jewish music is something else. They sing so well, an angelic kind of singing, a praise that is word of the Lord. But now this praise has been converted to entertainment of pagans. They are forcing them to praise or sing those songs of Zion to entertain them. So they could hide their instruments, their harps, on tops of trees, poplars, wallows. They are trying to hide because it's a shame to even carry Growing up in faith, I had a problem, a big problem with these kind of stories. Every time I could read a story that looks like, oh, God's people have been tormented. God's people have been abandoned. God's people have suffered and they appears like there's no help that is coming. In my small faith, in my small head, in my small heart, I could think, I think God is struggling to find a way to help them out. I think God could not help them. Maybe he didn't have a way out for them. I struggled with all those stories where I see uh, like God's people are suffering. God's people are struggling. It, it, it never went down well with me. Every time I read a story in the Bible, and it appears like God is helpless to help his people. Why did he have to allow all those things to happen? King Zedekiah moves across the desert, blind, eyes plucked out, lands in prison, dies in prison. But as I continued in my spiritual life, as I, uh, my faith continued to grow, I started to see things differently. That there are times when God just lets it happen. That he watches us go through it. Because he's God. Sometimes we not, we not see the reason why. Sometimes he will show us the reasons why. 
But key message, even God's people suffer. Even God's people go through hard times. I always say, because there are some people I preached to when I was a little younger in my preaching ministry, and I always feel sorry for them because I feel I want to go back to them and apologize. Because when we preached, to preach to them, we told them, please come. When you come to the Lord, that's the end of suffering. You suffer no more. You have joy every day. That's the kind of preaching we did. I just want to apologize to those people. And I want to preach differently. That come and be ready to carry your cross. Because there's nothing that is worthwhile in the absence of suffering. Because in the suffering, that's where wheat and chaff are separated. That's where we see if you are worthwhile. And by the way, ladies know this. More often than not, before uh, this is for Absalom, before you get to marry someone, <laughs> they always play very hard to get. Not knowing that they even want you to marry them more than you want <laughs> to marry them. But before you get the yes, you will have proved your worth. You will have proved that you deserve. Because if you just try and just smile at her and yes, yes, can we, you will never take her serious. I think in one way for God to keep on reminding us that he still exists is to bring suffering in our life. In this scripture by the teacher, Ecclesiastes, three eleven, he has made everything beautiful. Everything beautiful in its time. There is beauty even when things are hard. There is beauty even when your eyes are only seeing darkness. Because without a story, without tests, testimonies never come. Testimonies are only built from tests. A life without suffering, a life without pain, somebody said, is like growing mushrooms. You know mushrooms? Overnight, there they are. The next day, ready for harvest. And that's the weakest thing you ever find. They don't form because they don't go through hard time. But forming happens when the Lord allows you to go through those hard times because you want to have your character built. It's only through those times that our minds also reflect to God. When you see your life being so smooth, without any stress, without any worry, without any sickness ever, without anyone bothering you, please change your prayers. Ask the Lord to bring some hardships in your life so you can be a better person. People of God through suffering are required to retain their identity to know who they are. That's what was called keeping your faith, carrying your cross throughout. Whom am I? Because for the people of God, even if they suffered so hard, things were so tough for them, they never thought they would ever go back. They witnessed the temple in Jerusalem, the holy most place, go down into ashes. They witnessed their king Becoming blind, the strongest man in their land, carried to a foreign land and becomes a prisoner, dies there. They had no hope. But as Nehemiah had as Jeremiah had prophesied, after 70 years, they will come back. Because it's a time that is called God's time. God has everything figured out. 
after 70 years is the journey back. Within 13 years, we see three groups going back. The first group by the river bell, the second group by Ezra, and the final group by Nehemiah. They go back. And how do they go back? God uses another foreign power, another king from a neighboring country called Persia, modern day Iran. The king of Iran, the great King Cyrus, is empowered, becomes so strong. He conquers everyone, including Babylonians, and he takes even the land of Israel. Then Yahweh, the Lord himself, the one, the owner of time and space, speaks to now the man of the day, King Cyrus. I want you to take my people back to their land. I want them to rebuild Jerusalem. Because God's plan does not sway. That what God has predestined will still happen. So when you find yourself lost in trying to figure things out, it's not a good sign. Just be in the comfort that God has already figured things out. He wants to see within the tests, within the trials, within the tribulations that you're going through, are you going to still come out strong? Are you going to retain your identity as a child of God? We see many people who retain their identities. Young boys like Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. You see people like Daniel. Very tough times. But the whole land of Babylon knew that there are people who worship the God who lives, the creator of heaven and earth. And through them, God spoke to all those people, all the kings, even Nebuchadnezzar himself. By the way, God called Nebuchadnezzar my servant. So in your life and in your tribulations, don't categorize anyone as an enemy. We only have one enemy, Satan, the deceiver, the evil one. That's the only enemy. And the battle we fight is not a physical battle, but we fight a battle that is against principalities. We fight a spiritual battle. So everyone should be in the same team as us because God will use anyone, anytime, because he's the owner of time and space. He uses Nebuchadnezzar to punish them. He, the Bible states, it's not that he slept on his job. He wasn't somewhere trying to pull his hair, thinking, how am I going to protect these people from this man, Nebuchadnezzar? He oversaw all the happenings. But same guy brought another one called Cyrus, who threw away all the powers of the Babylons and the other neighboring countries and facilitated the going back of the people of God. Isaiah shares with us a message of hope. And Isaiah says, Isaiah 60, 22, the least one shall become a clan, and the smallest one a mighty nation. I am the Lord. In its time, it, I will hasten it. In its time, I will make it happen. Amen. This is what I want you to take home. That God has everything planned for us already. Every time you are troubled, every time your spirit is unsure, every time you are stressed out because you are not sure of what tomorrow holds for you, please remember, God has it figured out. And there's never one time when he becomes weak to the extent that he is struggling to figure out how to save you. Anything that you're going to go through is because God has purposed for you to go through it, for you to come out better, for you to enjoy eternity with him. In Psalms 40, 1 to 3, this is David saying, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, 
out of the mud and mire, she set my feet on a rock. Because there are some times when you will feel that you have waited. According to David, he waited patiently. In other words, what is this trying to say? He waited for a long time. In God's definition of time, there is no such a thing as a long time. If he has designed that this is the year for Sister Alupe to graduate, nothing will change that. Because to him, whereas maybe Sister Alupe was feeling, oh, it's taking so long, God had already figured it out. Within the journeys of life, we lose hope because we don't capture the element that God has everything figured out for us. And not to hurt us, but to do us good, like he promises. I want to finish with Jeremiah because it's in harmony with this text. Jeremiah 29, 4. This is a very famous uh, scripture. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses. You see, these people are crying. They want to get out. But what is Jeremiah prophesying to them? Build houses and settle down plant gardens and eat what they produce marry and have sons and daughters find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters increase in number there do not decrease also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because it, if it prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed in Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. God has plans to give us hope and a future, even if the present is crowded with darkness. Let us stay alive so we can enjoy the future that the Lord has prepared for us.